After reading through the comments section of one of my recent videos, where I detailed my experience with the second dose of the COVID-19 vaccine by Moderna, I realized that there's still a lot of vaccine misinformation out there. Hi, I'm Dr. Lewis Kren, family medicine physician. And in today's video, we're gonna go through six of the most common topics of vaccine misinformation that I read both in those comments as well as that I've read around the internet. Unfortunately, this vaccine misinformation threatens to slow down our vaccination efforts. All right, the first topic we're gonna to cover is this notion that physicians are paid to promote vaccines. In this case, the COVID-19 vaccine or even worse, that we're paid on a per vaccine basis. That is just absolutely absurd and frankly insulting. Neither myself nor any physician that I know is paid to promote vaccines. Why do I promote vaccines? I promote vaccines because they are safe, effective, I believe in the science behind them, and in this case, I believe it's a way out of this pandemic. So no, physicians are not paid to promote vaccines. The second topic that we're going to cover is this notion that the messenger RNA vaccines somehow alter our DNA. Now, again, that's entirely false, and let's explain why. Messenger RNA vaccines use a lipid nanoparticle to insert a small piece of mRNA into our cells that then uses the existing cellular mechanisms to create the spike protein common to the COVID-19 viruses that then express on the surface of our cells and create the immune response. In this case, the mRNA stays only in the cytoplasm of the cell. It never gets into the nucleus. The nucleus of the cell is where the DNA is housed. So it is impossible for the mRNA vaccines to mix with or alter our DNA. Now there was a second part to this one, and that was this notion that the vaccine manufacturers are somehow using chimpanzee mRNA and injecting that into our cells. Now, I can understand where the confusion came on this one. AstraZeneca actually uses a chimpanzee common cold virus as the vector to get the mRNA snippet into the cells. So I can understand the confusion of how somebody might get um, confused on how the messenger RNA was getting into the cell and which um, vaccine manufacturer was actually using that. But with the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines, they're using an mRNA molecule or an mRNA strand that codes only for the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. There's no chimpanzee messenger RNA anywhere in these vaccines. So I can understand how that one could be confusing to somebody who doesn't fully understand how these vaccines are made. Okay, the next topic is this idea that the vaccines were rushed. And this one might take just a little bit to explain because I, I could see how if somebody compares the fact that most vaccines take around five to 10 years to be developed, tested, and then approved, how we could do this in such a short amount of time for the COVID-19 vaccines. Now, this one takes a little bit of understanding of the normal process versus the expedited process that the COVID-19 vaccines went through. The first item we're gonna cover within this topic is the fact that the vaccines were not sufficiently researched. That actually is not true. These vaccines have been in development as well as the technology, particularly for the um, messenger RNA vaccines, have been in development for over 10 years. They were actually being used to develop vaccines for the MERS and SIRS virus, which were also coronaviruses, but those viruses fizzled out before they could actually get to market. And they became not needed, and therefore the vaccines were shelved. So that's why you've never heard of a messenger RNA vaccine being mass produced and mass distributed before. There have been other mRNA vaccines in development as well, including those for Ebola and HIV. So the idea that this is new technology is not really true. Now, let's address the idea that these vaccines were rushed through the approval process and therefore they're not safe. As you can see on the screen, the vaccines went through the usual steps that all vaccines go through 
It's just that some of the steps were overlapped and didn't require the normal time frame in between to step through because they were allowed to be overlapped. So the vaccines still went through animal testing. They still went through stage one, stage two, and stage three testing, just like all vaccines would normally go through. It was just done under an accelerated time frame. The other thing that the manufacturers did to speed up the process was actually start making the vaccine before they finished clinical trials. This was made possible by the fact that a lot of the governments around the world invested in these vaccines early on so that the manufacturers could do this. Obviously, they're not going to commit a lot of time, resources, and money on their own without the assistance of federal governments. So ultimately, what allowed these vaccines to be created in record time was this notion of an unparalleled international cooperation among sciences, cooperation amongst public and private entities, including federal governments, to help fund the vac vaccine trials as well as the vaccine manufacturing. And then you also have the idea that the vaccine was manufactured and ready for distribution as soon as the emergency authorizations were given around the world. So I think a better question to ask rather than why were these vaccines rushed, is really, why does it take 10 years in the first place for a vaccine to come to development? Now, one of the other things that helped these vaccines along in those clinical trials and why some of the trials were able to go so quickly is because when you're dealing with a global pandemic, you have plenty of opportunity for people, in this case, to be infected and to test the efficacy of the vaccine. In cases of some other vaccines that were being developed, the incidence of disease within the population may not have been high enough to let the vaccine trials run this quickly. That's another reason why other vaccines may take much longer to be developed. So I hope this helps you understand a little bit about why these vaccines were able to come to market so quickly. Now, another issue is this idea that we don't have long-term safety data. Now, I could understand where this concern comes from, and there have been a few severe side effects that have been investigated as possibly caused from the vaccines. And I actually made another video on that, and I'll link it uh, both up above as well as in the comments for you to check out more detailed information on those uh, concerns. However, what I want to say to this uh, concern in this video is the fact that if we look at the history of vaccines, and all the other vaccines that have been developed, any long-term consequences from the vaccine actually became evident within about four to five weeks after the vaccines entered mass distribution. So I think we can be pretty reassured that we will not see any long-term serious side effects of these vaccines because we've actually had over six months of experience with individuals who have had the vaccine. This goes back to the clinical trials as well as long-term surveillance from those clinical trials. Additionally, these vaccines are being scrutinized like no other vaccines before. And so individuals who are getting the vaccines now are also being monitored and asked to report any side effects or consequences of the vaccine. And these are being investigated as they show up. The CDC actually has the VAERS or Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System that is responsible for collecting this information. So I hope that this helps reassure you that we haven't seen any serious long-term consequences, and we shouldn't in the future either. Okay, the next topic that I want to cover is actually this idea that the vaccines are killing people. And I commented on this one in the last video that I made as well, um, the one that I just referenced, and again, um, link in the description down below. Um, however, I want to expand on that just a little bit in this video as well, because it still keeps coming back around that the vaccines are killing people. Now, I think we have to put that into context. Yes, there have been people who have died um, after receiving the vaccine. However, if we look at a study that was recently published, reviewing data from the VAERS system between December 14th and January 13th of 2021, it showed that 13.8 million doses were delivered during that time, and there were only 113 deaths reported to the VAERS system. 
For those of you mathematicians out there, if I'm doing the math right, that equates to about a 0.0008% death rate versus the 1.8 case fatality rate currently being associated with COVID-19. Now, if you dig into those 113 deaths, approximately 40 of them came from individuals who were on hospice or were otherwise labeled as DNR. Also, two-thirds of the total deaths were in individuals who lived in long-term care facilities with known multiple comorbidities. And then those deaths that occurred outside of the long-term care facilities were also in individuals who had multiple comorbidities. Now, this makes sense because during that time frame, our vaccines were mostly directed towards healthcare workers as well as individuals who lived in long-term care facilities. So it makes sense that the majority of those deaths would happen in individuals who were in long-term care facilities and in those who were elderly. Now, before everyone starts using this as uh, evidence that we're killing old people with these vaccines, you have to understand that the deaths during that time frame were nowhere near the expected death rate that one would see in just the general population from that age group. I know you can point to uh, news stories on the physician who died in Florida or other individuals who have died around the world. And unfortunately, yes, some people are going to die after they get the vaccine. That does not automatically mean that the vaccine caused the death. So please keep that in mind. And let's say for argument's sake that half of these deaths, and I'm totally making this up, but just to play the naysayer just a little bit, Let's say that half of those deaths actually were caused by the vaccine. Again, not saying that, and I don't think that'll ever be proven, but just for argument, let's say that half of them are. That still gives us a death rate much, much, much lower than the death rate from the COVID-19 virus itself. And that doesn't even take into account the fact that the vaccines are preventing moderate and severe disease. So preventing deaths preventing hospitalizations, hopefully preventing long COVID because we're preventing moderate and severe disease. So there are more benefits to the vaccines than just causing, not causing death or not causing, having death from COVID-19. So whenever people are using this information to try to scare you away from the vaccines, don't let them, don't let them say that the vaccines are killing people because they have no more evidence to say that the vaccines are killing people then frankly, right now, we have evidence to say that the vaccine has never killed an individual. So I, I think it's important that we take this in context of what the end goal of the vaccines are, which initially in the studies was to prevent death and severe disease as well as hospitalizations. The original studies were never designed to prove that you wouldn't get COVID. They were designed to prove that you wouldn't get moderate to severe disease and end up hospitalized, or even worse, death. So please keep this in mind as you're, again, considering whether you're going to take the vaccine or not. And please don't share that the vaccines are killing people unless you have documented evidence that they indeed are. So the last item that I want to touch on is this idea that the vaccines are not preventing disease. Now, Originally, in the studies, that is true. We did not have any data to show that the vaccines were preventing transmission of COVID-19 because that's not what the original studies were meant to do. However, now that we have more and more experience with the vaccine and millions and millions of people have gotten the vaccine around the world, we have some new studies that are coming out that are looking at whether or not individuals who have gotten the vaccine actually ever even get COVID versus just not getting severe disease. And the early studies, uh, two of them recently published out of Israel, are actually showing good promise that not only are the vaccines preventing severe disease, but they're also preventing COVID-19 infection regardless. The studies that I'm referencing show a decrease in transmission by about 60 to 80 percent. So again, not 100 percent. There is absolutely no vaccine out there that's 100 percent at preventing transmission or preventing disease. But decreasing transmission rates by 60 to 80% is huge. And again, if confirmed in larger studies amongst all the vaccine candidates that are out there, that should help us end this pandemic soon. Okay, that's all I have for you today. 
I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, I hope you'll consider subscribing to my channel, uh, commenting down below, let me know what you think about the video, or let me know other concerns you have regarding the vaccines. I'm happy to try to answer those if I can. And uh, I hope you'll uh, also consider liking this video. It helps uh, other people see the video. And as always, be safe out there.